What are the world's hardest problems and what is the promise of technology to solve them? One of the biggest problems I work on is inventing technology to try to help people who live with autism. I get a lot of email from parents of children on the autism spectrum who hear about my group's work and write me for help. I want to read a short excerpt from one. Uh, it kind of reminded me when I saw the subject line of the old Dear Abby column because the title in the subject was Desperate Father. Dear Professor, my colleague told me about a new fascinating technology he heard on BBC Radio 4. I have an eight-year-old son who is diagnosed with ASS. Unfortunately, I only know the Dutch term, but in English, it must be something like autism spectrum disorder. In general, he is normal, intelligent boy. Autism is the last thing that comes into mind when you see him. But sometimes, he starts disturbing the classroom or responds too aggressive against other children. It's his third year in school, and he is already in his third school. For the moment, he is going to a special school for children with learning disorders, but things still do not go as expected. We are going from one test center to another for four years now, and the pressure on our family is really hard. So I asked my colleague the details of the radio program, and he directed me to the recording. When I listened to the recording, I had to pause it halfway through as I was getting too emotional. I believe this technology can help us in important ways. Knowing the moments of fear, anger, concentration, he goes on, would be very useful as my son does not always recognize these feelings with him correctly. For example, we discovered lately that when he is hungry, he becomes aggressive without knowing he is hungry. Here I'll, I'll move ahead. The father goes on to describe how he went to our web pages where we had open sourced and put out descriptions for our technology, hoping people could use it for free. Uh, and he says, I, I can imagine that you receive many similar requests from parents for help and that you cannot respond to all of them. I found a lot of information on the FAQ pages, but although I have some experience with electronics, I do not see it feasible to build this device from scratch. Parts were changing, all this other stuff. Is there any way for me to cooperate in a test program, or is there anything similar commercially available? We would really appreciate your help. Again, my son is an intelligent child, and this could be decisive for his school career. Who knows what contribution he can make back towards science in the future? Signed, Desperate Father. The technology we invented at MIT reads some of the emotional information this boy needs help with, um, and it has now become commercially available. I'm, I'm wearing one version of part of it tonight, the um, Q sensor made by Affectiva. Um, full disclosure, I'm co-founder, chief scientist, chairman of the board. Um, this technology <laughs> is starting, and, and they're for sale, I'm supposed to, but, but we're not selling them here. Um, that's not the topic tonight. Okay. This technology, however, is starting to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, today, it's also enabling scientists and clinicians to do new research uh, in epilepsy to detect seizures and the intensity of the seizure, in PTSD and helping uh, desensitize people with phobias and helping people better understand anxiety disorders, and even in some new studies um, looking at what precedes cravings and the stress that may overcome people when they're struggling uh, through treatment with drug addiction. Years ago, here in Kresge, actually, we used a predecessor of this technology to measure audience responses. Instead of um, seeing these blinding lights and black behind them, um, I saw the audience light up with uh, the brightness of the LED when the signal that were, when one of the main signals that we're measuring went up. It went up, in fact, every time there was a live demonstration and the audience glowed. And every time there was a live interaction, a live um, Q&A session, uh, the audience glowed. Uh, it went up with each new speaker, and it went up with laughter. Um, however, unfortunately, we also learned that it, uh, with every PowerPoint presentation, uh, it <laughs> went down with a decaying exponential. <laughs> this technology has great uses, whether for entertainment, um, for medical, lots of, lots of uses. But it does not save the world. What if, what if it were so good that it could completely eradicate a condition such as autism. It cannot do that. But if we could invent a technology to wipe out a serious condition, would we want to do that? One of the things I have learned from people on the autism spectrum is that we have to be very careful and humble when we think we know what is best, especially when it involves another human life. 
we often fall short in our knowledge of what is best. For example, as I've gotten to know many people with autism, I have learned that many of them don't want to be cured of autism. Uh, many of them um, who cannot even speak will type, I don't want a cure, I just want tools that help me to adapt to my world and learn from it. I may have more trouble with it, but I still just want help. I don't want you to get rid of me. They don't want a new genetic test, a new technology that makes them detected before birth and likely to be aborted. That doesn't save anyone. It certainly doesn't help save the world. I'm hard pressed and challenge you, can you think of any technology that has never caused at least some serious problems, even if overall one might argue it has made the world better? I love my MacBook, um, but sometimes it malfunctions and it's probably gonna wind up in a landfill someday. Uh, wireless mobile technologies are bringing better health and learning to uh, our brothers and sisters in very poor and rural communities, um, but they're also allowing terrorists to make a phone call and detonate a bomb. I think vaccines make our world better, but they've also inadvertently killed people. Technology does not ultimately save our lives, even if it lengthens our life. We're all going to die. I'd love to invent a technology that provides world peace. There's a big problem. Um, but what technology could prevent evil people from seeking power and domination over others? Now, my team here builds technology that detects and analyzes emotion. Maybe we could help people regulate emotion, or maybe we could rid the world of war-prompting emotions like anger. Imagine. Um, but once again, we have to question that we have imperfect knowledge. Um, for example, what we think of as bad emotions are not all bad. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here at commencement years ago when Lee Iacocca spoke at MIT graduation. It was a really gorgeous sunny day, the grass was green, the sky was blue, the uh, students were so happy to finally be graduating, the parents were so happy to finally not have to pay bills. Um, the flowers were blooming and Lee Iacocca got up at the podium and he banged his fist on it. I can't do it as loud as he did there, maybe he had the microphone on the podium. Um, and he said, you must get angry, you must get angry. And he told all the graduates, you must get angry. And they're kind of like looking at each other like, who hired this guy to wreck our day, you know? Um, but why was he saying this? Because um, anger is not all bad, right? What we think of sometimes as bad with our imperfect knowledge um, can be good. Anger is a great motivator. It prompts you to stop putting up with a lot of the garbage out there and make something that is better. A technology that got rid of anger would also get rid of much of the good changes in our world. It would not save the world. What are sources of hope beyond technology? What does it mean to save the world, really? I mean, more specific, what does it mean to even save one person, uh, you or me? Here at MIT, we look to knowledge and great achievements to save oneself, to make a better world. But is that enough? I don't think it is. There was a time when Germany had many of the finest scientists, technologists, doctors, well-educated scholars in the world, uh, even social covenant in a contract, a very civilized society. They had brilliant achievements, and yet this well-educated, successful populace came to believe that a man, their leader, could save their nation by getting rid of what he convinced them was bad and promoting what he convinced them was good. This man did not submit to any greater authority. He scoffed at the idea that he should submit to God. Der Führer was the ultimate authority and he required not only the armed forces to swear allegiance to him, but also German pastors to swear allegiance to him. You know his name, Adolf Hitler. Putting oneself on the ultimate throne of authority, claiming to know how to save a nation is not a one-time tragedy. We've seen it repeatedly. Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Pol Pot, just a few of the names that have uh, illustrated what happened when somebody thought they knew what was best. And these individuals used technology to murder millions of, hundreds of millions of innocent people. Evidence shows repeatedly that when we try to save ourselves by being great, we fail. We can never be as good as we think we could be. We all fall short, myself included. 
Like most students who come to MIT, I had straight A's, number one in high school, number two, Georgia Tech, um, 5.0, PhD, course six here at MIT, some of the best friends a person could ask for, dated the cutest guys on the football team, high school. Um, I'm blessed with loving parents. On the faculty at MIT, I made it from the bottom all the way through tenure, promotion as full professor. I have a husband who is also an MIT Course 6 alum. Uh, we met in the computer room on a Friday night, he reminded me. Um, you might want to go to one after this event. Uh, he, he is amazing, um, married to me for 23 years, deserving of great respect and admiration. We have three loving sons, truly the best boys on the planet, I'm not biased. Uh, um, in research, you know, I've received thousands of citations, um, hundreds of keynote invitations, it, gratified to know my work has helped other people. I, I feel you know, enormously blessed by much of this and it brings me great joy, but you know what? Um, all of this, this worldly success, it pales completely in comparison to the greatest thing in my life. Knowing and being known by the one who made it all, the one from whom every good thing comes, the one who knows what the world truly needs to be saved, the one who knows and loves every single person on our planet, uh, you and me included, whether or not we behave in a lovable way, whether we respond with love in return, or whether we spit in return. None of my achievements, none of the generous gifts I've been given, even begin to compare with experiencing the abundant peace, mercy, grace, joy, healing, strength, and more when we but open our hands to receive these gifts. That gift giver, I believe, is the greatest hope and saving influence. Don't get me wrong, I still fall short, but my life is so much improved, so much more abundant, filled with peace for having taken myself off the throne of thinking what is best that I could know and make those perfect decisions. You can experience this too, uh, but you would also have to be willing to put one in charge of your life who knows how to run it better than you do. To conclude, I want to build great technology to help our world, and I want to give of whatever I have to help people in need, whether they have autism, epilepsy, a lack of ability to speak, or some other challenge that we might invent new technology to help. I delight in this work. But an even greater delight, um, the deepest I have ever experienced, is in knowing and being known by the ultimate source of all knowledge, power, mercy, strength, and goodness. This is the knowledge of the one who loves every person on the planet, the one who truly saves the world.